All right. Well, we're back. Heel fractures, we all deal with them. We all see them. Do you operate on them? Do you not operate on them? How do you operate on them? Simon Platt is going to provide us all the answers to the moderation of this next session. Um, this session is possible from sponsorship with Into Bones. So, Simon, it is all yours. Thank you very much, Selena. Thank you to the foundation. Uh, I'm currently on the Gold Coast and it's seven o'clock. We've got a great faculty with a wealth of experience. Uh, we are talking about heel fractures, a perennial and problematic issue. It's fairly universal. Uh, I've got with me Terence Chin from Melbourne, Arvin Puri from Cairns, Nick Jorgensen from uh, uh, Brisbane, and Jeff Hairboom from Brisbane. Uh, there are some talks, and we'll try and make it uh, as interactive as possible. And first up is Terence, who's going to give us a very brief overview of calcaneal fractures. Terence has been a foot and ankle surgeon for over 10 years in public and private practice and has an interest in trauma and reconstruction. Thank you, Simon. I'll just share my screen now. So uh, thank you again for this opportunity. So my brief today is just to go through a quick refresher course of calcaneal fractures, because I think the key to, um, to, to treating these well is to understand some of the basic principles. These are often high energy injuries that occur in a multi-trauma setting, commonly occurs in young people at their most economically um, important time of their lives. And these are often life and work altering injuries for, for, for these patients. Um, it's really important to understand the anatomy of the calcaneus. It's a very complex three-dimensional structure. It's got a posterior tuberosity. It's got a superior surface with articular facets for the talus. It's got, it's got an anterior process uh, for articulation with the cuboid. And medially, there's a sustentaculum, which is this bony ledge, uh, which provides support to the uh, middle and anterior facets. Typically, the mechanism of injury is an axial load where the lateral talar process is driven into the posterior facet and this can cause a joint depression fracture of the posterior facet, or if the posterior facet fragment is still part of the posterior tuberosity, then a tongue-tied fracture is, is then produced. These are often, the, the depression of the subtalar facet is often measured or described in terms of a, a, an abnormality of the bolus angles or, or Gassain's angle. Um, on the axial Harris view, it typically shows that the Length of the calcaneus is shortened, the tuberosity is typically in slight varus, and, the, and it's often laterally displaced. A CT scan is really important because it demonstrates the fracture in its full glory. Um, on the coronal view, uh, you can assess the degree of comminution of the posterior facet, and that has implications for prognosis as that comes under the Sanders classification. Um, and the sagittal and axial views, again, provides a, a deeper understanding of, of, of the fracture pattern and what the surgeon has to deal with. Um, the scan on the left is one where, the, where there, this is a high energy injury where the calcaneal fracture has uh, extended to the, cal to the um, calcaneal cuboid joint causing a subluxation of the joint. And the image on the right is meant to show a variation where there is a lateral wall blowout, but the posture facet has been subluxated laterally, and that can cause impingement of the perineal uh, tendons. And there's a fleck of bone that's been pulled off from the lateral malleolus, and that represents an avulsion fragment of the superior perineal retinaculum. So the perineal tendons can be dislocated as part of this injury. Despite these injuries being very common, there are predictable fracture patterns, and this has been described in detail by Carr in 2005. Um, and essentially, because the axial load um, occurs in a very predictable fashion, typically there are four main fragments that are produced. I won't go through all of them, but it is important to understand these fracture fragments because they dictate your reduction maneuvers and they dictate the sequence of how you achieve these reductions. The Sanders classification is the most common classification which is used, and it, it is basically a, 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 a reflection of how common you to the subtalar facet is. A Sanders 2 contains two fragments, Sanders 3, 3, and you know, it stands to reason that the more common you to the subtalar facet is, then the prognosis is, is more guarded, um, and that has implications for, 
for, for treatment, and we'll talk about that later on. Now, wh why do we have to reduce and fix these? Well, if left untreated, a, the uh, a calcaneal fracture where the subtalar joint is displaced, so where there's incongruity of the calcane and cuboid joint, then over time, post-traumatic arthritis will ensue. The talus then adopts a more horizontal position and that causes anterior ankle impingement because there's not enough room for ankle dorsiflexion to occur. With the lateral wall blowout, we've discussed this before, the, um, there can be subfibular impingement, the perineals get trapped or they can become unstable. And ultimately the heel will be short, it will be wide and that can cause footwear problems. The aims of treatment is as best as we can to achieve an anatomical restoration, to make the calcaneus look like a calcaneus again, to restore joint congruity to the subtalar and calcane and cuboid joint. And in the process of doing this, try to avoid wounding problems and infection. Historically, internal fixation had very bad results, but over time we've had better techniques with implants, better understanding of the fracture pattern and better understanding of the soft tissues to the point where right now um, surgery is indicated for most displaced intra-articular calcaneal fractures. There are uh, contraindications in terms of patients with peripheral vascular disease or severe diabetes, but, but in most cases, um, all things being equal, surgery should be considered for these displaced fractures. The principles of treatment, as we know, these are all multi, oh, they, they, this can occur as a multi trauma setting to address and manage life threatening injuries first. The calcaneus is then put into a, a back slab, fracture blisters are managed accordingly, and x rays and CAT scans are then taken. And at that point, we need to make a decision or judgment as to whether, whether any urgent reduction of grossly, grossly displaced fragments are required, whether there might be compartment syndrome occurring. And if none of these are considerations, then we can then plan for definitive treatment. Um, the, the, there are surgical emergencies, and this is an example of one where there is a displaced tongue fragment or tuberosity or fralsian fragment left untreated. Skin necrosis can occur along the Achilles tendon in, uh, uh, insertion. So this requires urgent reduction in fixation. But if the decision for surgery has been made, then there are a few different options for surgical approaches. There's the extensile lateral, sinus tarsi, and the percutaneous. The extensile lateral has been commonly used for many years. It is an L-shaped full thickness flap, which allows a good visualization of the entire calcaneus all the way to the subtalar and cal calcaneal cuboid joint. It is a fairly big dissection, uh, so it is important to wait for the swelling to decrease Although it does provide excellent exposure, there is a small but significant wound dehiscence and wound infection problems, and some of these complications can be very severe. The sinus tarsi approach is something that has also been around for some time. It is a much less invasive approach. It allows direct visualization of the posterior facet and the anterior process. And studies have shown that if used appropriately, these approaches have lower complications uh, rates compared to the sinus tarsi approach. It is becoming the preferred approach for many surgeons um, and certainly that's reflected in the, in the literature as well. Um, if you have a large posterior facet fragment or a more simple Sanders type 2 or a less common unit fracture, then the option of percutaneously fixing this is, is an option where chance pins or a lever can be uh, strategically placed to push up these fragments um, and then uh, lag screws or uh, screws that are used to fix these fragments. If a percutaneous approach is to be used, then it's best to do this early before the fracture consolidates. More recently, one of my colleagues has started to use this. These, this is a pin distractor with pins put in the talus and in the calcaneus and it's used to distract the subtalar joint. And this, this, num this does two things. It creates room in the subtalar joint for the posterior facet to be punched up uh, and reduced. It also helps to reduce the varus and the length of the calcaneus. So this is something that, uh, that, that, can be, that can be done. So in terms of surgical considerations, no, there's no approach that's perfect. It is important to match the surgical approach, the fracture anatomy and the soft tissue of state. Uh, if possible, less invasive techniques should be used. There is an increasing trend to use sinus tarsi approaches and percutaneous techniques. Uh, these continue to be very challenging, uh, difficult fractures to manage. Uh, surgical treatment is recommended for most of these fractures that are displaced. 
There is an increasing uh, uh, pattern to use um, less invasive approaches. And I think the, the, it is important to be able to understand the three-dimensional anatomy of the calcaneus and to understand the typical fracture fragments that can occur with these fractures, But that, because that allows a framework to then approach these fractures, plan reduction and fixation. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Terence. That's a great talk. So tell me, how, how many cases does it get to become comfortable with um, a less invasive technique because of your experience? Look, the, 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 there is some work in the literature that says that you, you should, you're only considered competent when you do 50 cases. Now, I, you know, I work in an institution where we see about 15 to 18 calcaneal fractures a year. So I'm not an expert by any means, but I think it is important to understand the fracture pattern really well. Um, and, and then we, you know, and if, if possible, um, assist another surgeon who is um, adept at this. And look, this is a little bit cliche, but there are uh, instructional videos uh, that are available uh, that provide a really good, um, uh, you know, really good way of, of, of um, showing how these things are done. So um, does that answer your question, Simon? Yeah. Uh, does the panel have any, anyone else have any experience or less invasive or is it just me still doing open approaches? Uh, open? Mainly open. <laughs> and, and another question, sorry. Mainly open as well. Okay. Simon, I would, I would say the, the sinus tarsi approach, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically my hands, it's basically an approach that you would do for a subtalar joint fusion. Uh, you might extend it a little bit mm. more. That allows you access to the posterior facet. It is a little bit more difficult to control the calcaneal durosity. Um, and in that set setting, a shant spin with, you know, in the same way that we've been taught with the extensor lateral approach, a shant spin into the heel uh, to really pull it out to length. Um, and uh, over time, and this is also reflected in the, in the literature, more and more surgeons are using a lesser invasive sinus tarsi type approach for more and more difficult fractures as they become more comfortable. But, but the approach is like you would do for a subtalar joint fusion. And how important do you think accurate joint reduction is compared to the trade-off for restoration of height and alignment? I, I find that a difficult question to answer because often even if you have good reduction of the joint or a particular surface, you still end up with a stiff joint or possibly arthritis due to the, the actual injury itself. Look, I, I think that the, the, the Sanders has shown that, um, that if surgery were to be undertaken, then patients who do well are those who have Sanders 2, some Sanders 3, with, with post-surgical evidence that the subtalar joint has been reduced or the, or the, anat or the, 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 pr the aim of anatomical reduction has, has been achieved. Um, the um, results drop off if uh, the subtalar joint's not reduced. Um, and I think in my experience, it's the, it's the subtalar joint that's key. I think the calcaneus can afford a little bit of uh, shortening, um, a little bit of lateral wall blowout, uh, but I think the, it is the subtalar joint that's important. You could, uh, some would also argue that the only way to reduce the subtalar joint is to actually reduce all the other parts of the calcaneal fracture. I've been in situations where I can't reduce the subtalar joint, and that's because the, the, the tuberosity fragment is still jammed up in between those two fragments. So, um, so it, look, I think it is important to try and um, reduce everything as best as possible. Great, thank you. I, I'm going to move on to Arvind, who works in Cairns. He's had 10 years of experience in the public and private uh, orthopedic surgery, and he has a different approach. He's, he's got the Cairns fix and fuse approach to Thank you, Simon. I'll start sharing my screen now. Right. Thank you very much, Simon, for the introduction. And uh, thank you very much, Terence, for such great groundwork that you have already laid down, making it very easy for this session to carry forward. 
So my talk is going to be about a way of fixing or addressing these calcaneal fractures, which hopefully prevents a long-term disability and problems from the late complication of subtalar arthritis, which usually occurs in fractures which are more comminuted and obviously intraarticular. So before I go on to the next slide, I'd like to bring to your attention this quote from P.D. Wilson in 1927, when he first published his article on the treatment of oscalsis fracture by primary fusion of subtalar arthrodesis. And these words hold even true today. So as Terence had mentioned, the biggest problem with these fractures are the ones which fall in Sanders three and four. They are the ones which are very difficult to reduce. They are the ones which always leave us somewhat unhappy. And they are the ones which eventually will go on with given time to subtalar arthritis and may require an arthrodesis. So what is really the incidence of subtalar arthrodesis in these fractures as seen in literature? So if we go back to Sanders 1993 paper, he said that about one in five type three and 70% type four fractures ended up getting subtalar arthrodesis. However, when he revisited his patients after 10 to 20 years of follow-up, the numbers had increased significantly. Now it includes one in five type two and nearly 50% of type three fractures. But even more significant is the delay between initial management and injury and the time to arthrodesis, which is averaging anything between one to two years. So these patients had to put up with their symptoms for that length of time, at least, until they got fusion, which hopefully improved their functional outcome. So in a bid and an effort to find out, are there any predictors of patients or fracture characteristics which could give us an idea of which are more likely to go ahead and require subtalar arthrodesis, Buckley in 2002 and 2003 put forward these criteria. If the patient was male, a heavy manual laborer, under workers' compensation, he had a five times the chance of getting subtalar arthrodesis. If your borders angle was less than zero at presentation, you had 10 times the chance of getting subtalar arthrodesis. If you're in Sanders grade three or four, at least five times the chance of getting an arthrodesis. And if you are managed non-operatively with Sanders three or four, then the chance of getting a subtalar arthrodesis in the future was at least six times. So these are pretty significant numbers amongst this group of patients. So in Keynes, in 2011, Will Bryson, who's the other foot and ankle surgeon, and myself, we started forwarding patients the option of perhaps undergoing another surgery, which could avoid the prolonged disability time and requiring a second surgery. And I'm going to try and show you through a small study that we ran, the benefits of perhaps doing primary subtalar fusion in oscalsis fractures, which are grade three or four amongst the standards classification. So this retrospective study covers a period of eight years and all the patients who underwent open reduction internal fixation along with primary subtalar arthrodesis at both the public and the private hospitals were included. There's been 16 patients, all of which were males with an average age of 49 years and one third of these patients had workers' compensation. So the surgical technique, as was shown in the last talk, initially we used the extensile lateral approach, but with the advent of sinus tarsi, we have been using this approach practically every patient that has had a primary subtalar fusion. The aim has always been to try and reconstruct the height, the width, and the axis of the calcaneus, elevate the articular surface, fix the fracture, then denude the cartilage, and then fuse with the variable pitch screws.
Now, initially, when we were using the external side lateral approach, we would go and take some of the loose pieces out, denude of cartilage, and put it back in again. But we have found that in trying to elevate it as best as possible, but not aiming for a dead level articular surface, we, using a burr, have found it much easier to denude the posterior facet of the calcaneus. So the group of patients, uh, quite understandably, belong mostly to the Sanders 3 and 4 groups. And we have had our complications. We had one superficial wound infection, which was in the Sinostarsi group and resolved with oral antibiotics. We had two patients who returned to theater. One was a patient who had wound breakdown after an extensive side lateral approach and had to go back to theater for debridement and skin grafting. And the second patient who returned to theater had prominent hardware, which required removal of metal. Significantly, the return to work averaged at 27 weeks in this group of patients. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of patients who had undergone this procedure. So here's an example of a 48 year old manual laborer who fell from a height, sustained a closed intraarticular comminuted calcaneal fracture, and he ticked all the boxes to be offered a primary subtalar fusion, which he consented to and underwent using the sinus touch approach, a low profile, minimally invasive plate, which was contoured for calcaneal fractures and two variable pitch screws to fuse it. He was fused fully between two and a half to three months and went back to work on the 28 week mark. The other patient was a 67 year old gentleman who had recently retired and had planned to go around Australia in his camper van. However, and unfortunately, he fell off the back of the camper van resulting in this comminuted intraarticular displaced calcaneal fractures and was again a patient who was offered the same primary subtalar fusion, which he underwent in the same manner, same exposure, same fixation and fusion and resulted in a good out. Prior to getting these contoured plates, we used to improvise and use the small fragment synthesis plate, perform the job of what the new recent plates done, but the variable pitch screws have always been the same. So what is our current practice? Our current practice is that we offer the open reduction internal fixation and the primary subtalar fusion to those patients who got Sanders grade three or four, definitely male who are under work, workers' compensation. Also, we will offer this to patients who are above 65 years of age, are fairly active, but have well controlled comorbidities. And we have certainly found a place for this procedure in polytrauma patients. The advantages are quite clear. It's one operation. There's certainly an earlier return to work or activities. There has been no increase in complications when compared to open rush and general fixation of calcaneal fractures, provided this is carried out in a very carefully selected group of patients. Thank you. Thanks, Arvin. That's a great yeah. presentation. Thanks, Thank guys. Hey, Simon, a few questions came in regarding yes. sinus tarsi, and maybe you guys can answer this. The first is, how do you prevent injury to the CFL ligament in a sinus tarsi approach? I might take that. The, the CFL ligament is attached to lateral wall of the calcaneus, just behind the perineal tubercle. Um, often, in order to apply the plate, a subperiosteal dissection has to be done. So the CFL ligament, if required, will be lifted off. But it's, it's, it'll, it'll gum back down and heal back down. So it's, it's generally not something that, um, that we need to consider. Okay. And when you have that lateral wall blowout, yeah. how do you address that with the sinus tarsi? The... Lateral wall blow. So, if if the, the lateral wall blowout can be pushed back, and typically the lateral wall blowout can be reduced with local pressure once you've actually reduced the length of the posterior tuberosity. Does that make sense? You pull everything out, um, and the lateral wall, because it's a, usually a thin sliver of bone, it doesn't provide a lot of structural support. The the key thing with the sinus tarsi approach is that you raft you put a raft of screws underneath the subtalar joint, and then you use the plate to connect the anterior 
process of the calcaneus all the way to the posterior tuberosity. That's, that's, that's the key. And then the last question is, how often are any of you using the medial distractor to get that reduction? To be honest, that's, oh, sorry. I, I have a colleague who's starting to use that very, very consistently. Um, I've only used it once um, with some, and it was good, and so I plan to use it more, more often. And it's, it's, it's something that's um, relatively new to our practice, but it is, it is proving to be very useful. So, so it, it is very useful. Personally, I've used it quite a bit, but where yeah. I really even find it more useful is when you're doing a distraction arthrodesis, you know, a delayed. Yeah. And so we do a straight posterior approach and you drive that, that uh, the uh, pin distractors, uh, either medial or laterally, whichever way you have to be. Yeah. Yeah. It really helps to not only get that distraction that you want, but also get the realignment. So it works yeah. very well. Thanks, guys. Arvin, do you have any patients before your series to compare to? How did you select them? Have you got any control? So, so what we did was, depending on, as I mentioned, if the patient had a grade three or a four Sanders, was a male, a heavy laborer, maybe workers' compensation, non-smoker, definitely no comorbidities, and we knew this was going to progress on to subterior arthritis due to the nature of the fracture, we would offer it to the patient. Uh, and, and, and if the patient accepted it, there were some patients who didn't accept it at all. So we had to convince them of the benefit of having one operation rather have to come back at nine months, a year, or year and a half and getting the second operation done. Um, a lot of them could see the benefit of that and would go ahead and have it done. And I must say, they have been quite happy at the final outcome. And, and how many of your previous grade three or four patients did well or... Do you have any idea how they how many underwent? The so if surgery? I compare them, if I compare them with the calcaneal open reduction and dolor fixation, which we did prior with the extensile lateral approach and more recently with the sinus star side, especially those who refuse to have this primary subpair, uh, I cannot give you that numbers, but a lot of them have had gone on to have injections in the subtalar joint of steroids for pain relief. And they are heading towards, and some have already been. Uh, um, patients who require subtalar arthrodesis. So my own experience and the experience in Keynes itself is that these patients, even though they are fixed, and like I said, when you fix these fractures, you don't always have a warm glow of sense of satisfaction. They usually come back to you at some stage saying they become more sore and they do need something else done for them. I'm aware that time is moving on. I'll ask Jeff Pearbon to now. Uh, Jeff is an orthopedic surgeon in Brisbane and practiced for 25 years um, with a huge experience of medical surgery. Um, okay, I'll just start sharing the screen. I hope this all works. Um, okay. Am I working there? Okay. All right, so uh, this point, calcaneal fractures aren't like ankle fractures. They are, can, the calcaneus is a, um, is, a, is a brick. To break it, you hit it with a sledgehammer. And the importance about that is the Im immense amount of soft tissue swelling uh, that comes with it. So there's both a bony and a soft tissue injury, and uh, they can be exceptionally comminuted. And so, I'm trying to advance this. Why is it not advancing? So it, I think that it's really important to start with um, uh, an expectation, uh, management of the expectations after these sort of fractures. The, um, I try to explain to patients that there's been this immense amount of soft tissue injury which can't be altered and that um, where our job is to make this less bad, we will not make it good. Um, and I think that while there are a number of uh, classification systems, when you look at uh, um, the fractures and we're talking about Sanders classification, and also when we're looking at complications, which sort of tend themselves to early and late and general and specific, I find that I 
end up talking to patients in these sort of terms about what I would call absolute and less absolute problems. So I think there are some absolutely inevitable problems. And this is to do with the soft tissue injury. So this is going to dictate whether or not and when they can be managed. But with the soft tissue injury, there's going to be issues of um, swelling, which could be so profound as to cause the fracture blisters, and we've all seen those, and the hematomas, which will then come with them, and then even areas of necrosis. So managing the soft tissue is an important part in trying to get through the entire problem of the fracture and the complication. I really think that the issue about the heel pad injury is underestimated. Um, the calcaneus has to be, the same amount of force went through the heel pad as the calcaneus, um, and that means that it's burst. And so I tell people that um, if you were in the habit of walking barefoot, you're not anymore. You're going to need some sort of footwear all the time. When you get up in the loo in the middle of the night, you're going to be looking for slippers or sandals to put on because you won't want to walk on the hard tile. It's part of the problem. The next issue is arthritis. I believe some degree is inevitable. The same amount of force went through the articular cartilage. So I think that there is a certain amount of arthritis that is determined the nanosecond this fracture happened. We can try to um, deal with the joint incongruity that comes about but the articular cartilage has been damaged and I think it's important to accept that. The other issue is we think we're certain there's some degree of some tailor joint problems. And I think Terence's point about the anterior ankle impingement is absolutely important. I think the heel, getting the heel length right to prevent the other major hind foot joints succumbing to arthritis is, is imperative. And I think that's one of the major driving reasons to restore that heel height in, uh, in the treatment of the calcaneus. Compartment syndromes, the numbers are coming out that, you know, up to 10% of people with Saunders three and four get compartment syndromes. And the late problems of them curl, toes curling over and causing pain are really important. And while we might be flippant and say, well, it's not that hard to fix it because it's just a flexive tenotomy, um, I think that um, being aware of the problems early on is really important. Terence is right on the money about the perineal tendon dislocation. Um, and when you look at it from, uh, from a CT, it's pretty obvious that the, um, that the lateral wall blowout takes the tendon with it and also leads to the problem of fibular impingement. So non-reducing that, that lateral wall or, or bringing the whole of wall uh, will lead to the issues of fibular impingement, which is you know, the part of the, the problem long-term. The less inevitable but real problems are often to do with our attempts to fix it. So with respect to both the issues, well, we can bundle the first three, the infection, wound dehiscence and neurovascular problems really associated with that, um, the extensile lateral approach. Um, because even though it's supposed to be a, vas a well vascularized flap, we can plan to put it in the right place. We can see the sural nerve, we're not gonna hit it. We do our operation, it looks so sweet. And then the, um, the blood supply uh, is knocked off and then the troubles of wound hissance and infection. Um, you know, people argue about the incidence of it, but I think what we would call major problems happen in at least 5% uh, when we're dealing with the type three and four. Malunion um, is the real issue. And I find it frustrating when we're looking at x-rays um, from uh, in the journals when laterals are put forward because uh, getting the height and getting the joint reduction is right. And But the issue I think is we don't pay enough attention to the varus that exists. And, um, and so, you know, in, in this um, cadaver specimen, you know, even though we've it looked okay on the x-rays on the lateral, the varus is there, the articular joint surface isn't quite right. But if you look at the, the yellow arrow, we can see that the articular cartilage has been lost off that lateral facet. And that's what I mean. Uh, sorry, the lateral portion of the posterior facet. And that's exactly what I mean about some articular cartilage is done 
at the nanosecond that this happened. And so therefore, some degree of arthritis is um, absolutely um, uh, going to happen. And I think that most people will have been there when we put the, um, the joint back together and, and we'll see that there's some areas that just have no cartilage on it. And I think that Arvin's um, uh, flexibility, the flexibility to go to a primary subtalar arthrodesis when you know full well there's no cartilage in the area is, uh, is, uh, is really important. And if this is something I discuss with people if I'm doing this, that they may come out and, um, and I've, I've used their subtalar joint because there was just no cartilage and it was rather pointless for them. So just to summar, uh, summarise it, um, it's, I think it's really important to recognise the, the bone and the soft tissue injury. I think, as I said, it's, you're aiming to make it less bad and, uh, and not normal. Um, and it, it's, I think that uh, if patients are brought into it, understanding the enormity of it, that, uh, that I won't say better outcomes, but they're more accepting of whatever needs to be done. Thanks. Thanks, um, So should we be operating on calcaneal fractures? And if so, how do we pick our winners? Um, I think that absolutely we should be um, operating on calcaneal fractures. Um, but I think it, when I do it, my goals are different. I'm saying to them, I want to restore the heel height. I think that even if you do go on to do developing arthritis later on, having had your calcaneus uh, uh, made into the shape a calcaneus should be, the subtalar arthrodesis you will get will be vastly superior. So even, even in Saunders 2, when I say to people, you, know, you still have a probability of getting arthritis on this. If we do the reconstruction and keep the joint, then um, if you do have to have a subtalar fusion done, I think you get a better subtalar fusion. And if, the, if you go in there and the joint's terrible, then I think a primary arthrodesis is much better. When, when should I be operating? Um, I think that if you are sitting there and you're seeing the, the, uh, the joint depression, so if they've gone, um, I, I base it on the subtalar joint depression. If the subtalar joint is depressed down, and you've lost um, your bowler's angle, then I think you are well aware that those people are going to get problems with both their ankle and their subtalar joint over time. And, um, and I think that a distraction arthrodesis is a really hard operation to get really good. Um, and even in people who, when if you read the studies when they're talking about when they're doing the distraction arthrodesis, even with um, allograft, they're talking about a, a four millimetre, five millimetre increase in heel height, which is much less than you will get by doing uh, doing your intervention earlier. So I think that you have to, I, I'm um, pretty pushy about people saying that um, if I haven't got good heel height and I've got depression of the subtalar joint, I think that, um, that uh, going in earlier is better. And I'll, I'll move on, but how do you, in terms of post-operative management, when do you allow weight bearing or range of motion? What's your what's your regime? So, if you're successful fixation, adequate fixation. If I'm happy with the fixation, I think um, most people will be saying we've got to deal with that soft tissue component, and therefore early movement is important. So, I'm happy for them after about two weeks. Once I've got the wound in a comfortable position, I'm I'm happy for them to be moving. But I, I generally find that uh, I won't be in a position to weight bear them until about the eight week mark. Um, and so they're, they're the numbers that I tend to use. And even if I do a primary subtalar arthrodesis, because I still have the, the calcaneal fracture that I want to heal, I, I tend to keep them non weight bearing for the eight weeks as well. Marvin, with your primary fusion, how, how quickly do you get them going? Oh, I, w I, I wouldn't let them weight bear for at least about between eight to 10 weeks. Because even those studies have shown, Simon, that they seem to heal better, maybe a little bit quicker. My own experience has been that I just want to slow them down. Mm -hmm. And with that variable pitch, if I've got a reasonably good apposition of the two surfaces, I'm willing to wait between eight to 10 weeks before I let them wait bear. But I'm happy for them to start some dorsiflexion and flexion exercises. So to move them to a moon wood is not a problem, but to get them weight bearing, definitely between eight to 10 weeks. And does anyone have a particularly strong opinion on smokers? Because that's very common in my patient population. Um, so we have decided 
as a unit to try and convince them to give it up before we go ahead. And if they refuse, we let them know the complications, including amputation, and most likely try and encourage them to go the non-operative way. Nick, do uh, you have an opinion on smokers? Yeah, I like to have a strong opinion on them and not operate on them, but I kind of have given up uh, to some degree. I'll, I'll do all the preoperative counselling as well, but I think at some point, um, some of the fractures, as you know, we've talked about, I think uh, you know, warrant fixation, and it's just something that um, we all have to go in with our eyes open. And what's your timing for surgery? So do you, do you let soft tissues resuscitate for a while? What's your what's your indication to go in early or late? Um, uh, soft tissue is king, I think. Um, uh, the only proviso with that is if I'm thinking about some sort of percutaneous uh, fixation, whether it is, um, you know, with a destructor, I've done a couple of cases, or, you know, with a sinus tarsi approach, and then um, approaching even like a percutaneous column um, or, you know, tuberosity fracture, I do like to try and get them on the earlier end simply because it makes fracture manipulation a little bit easier and therefore I feel like I can, you know, I'm not, you know, even though it's a small cut, I'm not sort of reefing on the foot as much as I, you know, as I should. Um, but in those ones where I've already uh, resigned myself to a, a the extensor lateral approach, it's all about soft tissue and then I, I just deal with whatever callus is in it at the time. And Terence, what's your time frame for, or maximum time frame for a, percutaneous type approach or sinus tarsi approach what's your optimal timing typically i'd like to get to them within five to seven days um, after seven to ten days then it becomes very difficult to manipulate the fracture fragments particularly with the sinus tarsi approach because you don't have access to um, direct access if you like to the posterior tuberosity um, I think you make a decision based on the soft tissues. If you feel that the soft tissues will settle and you can do, you, and you would like to do a sinus tarsi approach, you plan for that. If you feel that the soft tissues just will not tolerate it, then you either wait two, three weeks and then do an extensor lateral approach, or you um, decide to do everything percutaneously and you take your chances. You tell the patient, this is such a horrible injury that um, the subtalar joint's depressed, uh, there is no meaningful way to address this um, with an open procedure, then it might be possible just with a percutaneous technique just to push the subtalar fragment back to being closer to the subtalar joint, get the heel a little bit out of varus um, using a couple of strategically placed screws, and then just accepting that you have a calcaneus that's shaped like a calcaneus, and then that will make your future subtalar joint fusion just a little bit easier. So uh, are, we, are we effectively planning for a subtalar joint fusion? Should we be doing it ab initio or uh, are, we, are we in with a fighting chance with a sound of three or four? Why don't you take it that out? Numbers get worse as time goes by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I certainly think that three and four will, will definitely be uh, going towards subtalar arthritis is just a matter of time. Mm. It is okay. just a matter of time. Now, patients vary. Some of them are happy to carry on with subtalar arthritis. Maybe their demands are not as much. But if there is somebody who's youngish and is active, employed, he or she will come back to you with arthritis, which will be painful and stiff enough for you to warrant doing an arthrodesis for them. Okay. Uh, over to Nick now, who's a relatively new consultant in a tertiary trauma centre in Brisbane, who is going to show us some cases. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Simon and team. It's always good to follow a uh, talk about complications with um, some patients who are going to prove some complications. Uh, I'm working in Brisbane. This is the Story Bridge. Um, it's accessible enough that, unfortunately, people um, jump off it from time to time. And this is the case of a 26-year-old female um, who essentially will focus on her bilateral compound hind foot injuries, um, but she came in with uh, multiple thoracic um, lumbar and uh, sacral fractures, as well as chest injuries, uh, fractured left tibial shaft, and um, uh, pretty much destroyed um, left hind foot with both calcaneus fractures, uh, subtalar dislocation, talonavicular dislocation, midfoot fractures. And then um, to add to it, uh, on the right-hand side, the slightly better of the two, 
uh, from a bony uh, point of view, um, but um, equally bad compound wise. So the usual um, treatments happen uh, according to our um, uh, life-saving uh, paradigm and at some stage after um, stabilisation of her uh, spinal injuries and chest injuries, uh, we get into theatre and we're able to put on some um, uh, frames as well as um, some uh, percutaneous KYs after debridement, uh, really uh, in, in, in terms of damage control. And then effectively from this point of view, we've got a number of considerations. We've obviously got the global status of the patient, which will sort of dictate um, uh, a lot of things first and foremost. We've got soft tissue coverage concerns. So it's a, it's a case that involves our plastic surgical colleagues from the get-go and really what sort of timing do they want? And that's again, a reflection of the global um, status of the patient. And then we can focus on our part, which is really the complex, you know, calcaneous fractures with both hind foot and mid foot dislocations, and really timing or, or consideration of, um, of of approaches around the foot. We eventually um, get to the patient. I'll come back to the, the to the panel about what their thoughts are. But we, you know, a little bit later on, we fix up her long bone fracture, um, and we're able to get a better position of the foot. Uh, realistic, really, they're starting to look like uh, hind feet again, which is important for our, our soft tissue coverage. And she managed to get bilateral uh, free flaps, um, which have taken very well. And now, finally, at about the five week mark, we're comfortable with the flaps, with the foot, with the patient themselves. Um, and really, we start thinking about approaches. And um, from, from this point in view, um, uh, you know, uh, as we've previously discussed, like minimally invasive um, uh, techniques aren't really available unless we're going to leave those KYs in and call that our fixation. Um, and unfortunately, given the amount of um, uh, trauma, both through the calcaneus, which is unfortunately not an isolated issue in this patient, but uh, through the talonavicular joint on one side and um, the, through the whole of the medial column on the, on the contralateral side. And this was really done through an extensile lateral approach. We've talked about the reasoning. Um, uh, I couldn't see another way of actually um, uh, getting any meaningful fixation um, uh, throughout that. It avoided the medial side and her free flap, which had thankfully taken, and her pedicle was based off her posterior tibial artery. And then really a, um, a sort of a dorsal approach, you know, at the interval between um, uh, 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 tibialis anterior and EHL. And we're able to sort of do some bridge plating in order to restore the medial column and, and, and overall the, um, the, the shape of the foot. And um, I, I think a case like this, you really uh, have to take what you are given um, at the time. And realistically, we're managing the patient from a, a physiolo you know, physiological issues, um, her spinal fractures uh, and recovery from that side of things went really well, their tibial nail and, um, and as we've, as um, Jeff has talked about, it's really about expectations and management of this soft of this issue, which is both bony and soft tissue. And it's no surprise that even at two years, it's the calcaneal injuries and the the, the heel injuries that are still the most um, morbid in all of that. But I, I would ask the question to the group: like, is there any role for leaving the KYs in there? Is there any role for uh, primary um, uh, fusion at this stage, knowing that this is a relatively young patient and her story? Um, uh, is probably still yet to be told completely. Terence? Nick, I think, I think you've done a, a stellar job. I mean, um, open fractures, open calcaneal fractures, the, the open injury adds another level of, uh, of uh, risk. Uh, and uh, she has had a, what could have been you know, limb threatening injuries and you've, uh, you've been able to save her legs. I, th I think that there, there could be, you, you, you know, there could be an argument to fuse her subtalar joint uh, initially, but you've given her a chance. She's young. She's not, she's not, a, she's not a manual laborer. Uh, so she may not have a, a lifestyle which requires her to, um, to be on her feet for long periods. So you've, you've given her a chance. I, I guess at some point, will you be coming back to remove the, um, telenovicular fixation? Yes, uh, so I removed those at, um, at about the uh, year mark when they started becoming quite bothersome. Um, wasn't in any rush to go back any earlier, yeah. though, you know, anywhere from about four months onwards with, um, with some bony union um, evidence in the medial side of fractures, I would have. 
Um, she has come back for some tonality releases and, um, and unfortunately, in an IP joint fusion for some um, uh, token tractures um, following her operation about the year and a half mark. So it's certainly, in, she's had multiple operations. Um, and the plates will, uh, uh, you know, aim to be left in there unless they cause problems on the line. Nick, how common in your practice are open fractures? Uh, open calcaneal fractures, um, yes. thankfully not as common. Um, uh, I'd probably see one of these or our department would see something like this maybe once every six months. So thankfully it is quite rare. Um, but the bilateral uh, high energy traumas, unfortunately, probably about one every month to one every two months. Um, we have a couple of questions, guys, that have come in. Um, any role for PRP in treating the heel pad injury? Does anyone experience a PRP? No. 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 All right. The next question is, when you see significant collapse of the posterior facet and then you reduce it in that void that is created, are any of you routinely bone grafting? And if so, where do you get that from? No, I've never felt the need to bone graft that. I, I second I'll be bone grafted. Uh, I've never bone grafted one. Okay, perfect. And the last question was that, and I'm not sure which case this is referring to, but for the case where you expect um, poor subtalar motion, why not just fuse the subtalar joint? Good question. <laughs> Arvind, you might be the best place to answer this question. Um, I didn't, I, I, sorry, I didn't catch, catch that. Something yeah, is not so quite the When, you know, if you're in the operating room and you're expecting very poor subtalar motion, why not just do a primary fusion at that time? Yeah, I, I'll just two things about it. If I've got a patient who has refused to have a primary fusion, right? not consented for it, I'm then obliged to fix his calcaneus, but let him know that he will need something at a later time. If the patient gives us a consent for both, and some patients have done that, they have said, that's fine, you can fix it, and I'll prefer that, but if you do find intraoperatively that it is not salvageable, fuse it, I've done that as well. Can but I, it all depends. I, yes, go on. So I was going to add that um, I never anticipate stellar subtalar joint movement uh, with a calcaneal fracture. I mean, I think there's a difference between having a stiff subtalar joint and a stiff and painful subtalar joint. Um, they're, they're kind of two separate entities and patients will tolerate a stiff joint, uh, but they won't tolerate a stiff, painful joint. Uh, perhaps Jeffy might be the best place to talk on this if your experience of painful pain. I think you're right. I think that the, we have to recognise that stiffness of itself is is not is is to be expected because of the injury that happened i think that stiff and painful is absolutely the issue but that also means that stiff and painless because you fused it primarily is perfectly acceptable to people and i've had plenty of patients who've had uh, a primary arthrodesis done who are perfectly happy with the outcome Fantastic. We have two minutes left. I don't know if it's time to wrap up, Celine. Um, yeah, I think uh, if there's any last comments in the last two minutes. I Excuse reckon me, Nick, Celine. that was a fantastic job on that woman. That was a nightmare. <laughs> have any of you done the balloon reduction of the posterior facet, taking the almost like the kyphoplasty balloons and using that to do your reduction no no i've i've heard about it selena i haven't done it what's the actual balloon how do what do what what balloon do they use for that yeah so so we use the same balloon as you do for kyphoplasty that's either unilateral or 360 and yep. you put it right underneath the depressed fragment and then yep. you pop it up just like you were talking about terence with the sinus tarsi approach yeah which allows that lateral blowout then to be compressed manually yeah uh, yeah because it's such a thin lateral wall yeah you can, yeah if you do it early enough you can just compress it manually yeah 
So I may have misrepresented the answer, the, the, the question to how does the sinus tarsi approach address the lateral wall? I think a lot of the lateral wall blowout comes from the displaced posterior facet fragment. So if, and that, if that is reduced, the lateral wall, as you say, is a sliver and that will follow that. And the, the sinus tarsi plating system will capture the, um, the anterolateral fragment just underneath the posterior facet. So, uh, uh, you know, so, so that will in effect control some of that blowout. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Perfect. Simon, thanks for uh, bringing some insight into such a common injury. And thank, thank you. the entire team and the panel for uh, spending your, your time with us today. Uh, we are gonna be back in a few moments. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.